As I'm sure most of you have heard by now, Steinberg's brand new Cubase 13 is officially out with lots of new features and functions, only it's pretty hard to get an idea what it looks like compared to the previous version unless you put them together side by side. So in this video, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Hey guys, it's Steve from Featherlight Studio and Cubase 13 has been officially released and there's a ton of new features, instruments, plugins and everything, but it's pretty hard to get an idea of what that actually looks like compared to the previous versions unless you see them side by side. So that's exactly what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna run through each one of the new features and we're gonna put it up side by side with the previous version Cubase 12. So you can get a better idea of exactly what they look like compared to each other and see whether or not the update is worth it for you. Let's check it out. One of the first big changes in Cubase 13 has been a major overall in the graphical layout. So let's dive in and take a look at whether or not this is something that you can live with because it's probably going to be something you either love or you hate. On the left side here, we have our familiar Cubase 12 layout and we have our inspector tab. These are our familiar expandable tabs. We click on them, they expand down to reveal the information or the fader or the notepad or whatever we need. The new inspector tab has consolidated a lot of that information, same tab structure. So simply by clicking on it, it expands. Nothing much has changed here. A little bit different graphical layout. They've changed the orientation of the fader view a little bit. So it's a bit cleaner if we look at them side by side, but it's also smaller. They've condensed some of the information here. So everything is basically pretty much where it was. They've consolidated some of the information up here in the top and made it a bit easier to get to. Some of it may be a bit more confusing because it's an awful lot of bright white text on just gray background. So this at first might be a bit more jumbled, but this will be the kind of thing that's up to you completely as to whether or not this is easier for you to use or whether it's more confusing. One area that was improved, I think, was we can have the upper area data window open at the same time the fader is open. This gives us more information at a glance. And something that we haven't been able to do before, if we click on the gear cog like on 12, except here we simply right click in the blank area. This opens up all of the available tabs we can make visible. But for the first time, we're able to reorder their appearance and they update immediately. This is great for customizing exactly the way you want to work. And it also takes some confusion out of things like, for example, if the EQ tab looks like it's post, but it's still actually in the pre position. Along with all the changes to the graphical interface and layout and the new additions to the inspector tab and the way it works, Steinberg has also changed the way the tab systems work themselves and they've added a new one. So in Cubase 12 and preceding versions of it, we had our regular inspector tab here and this was a pretty familiar way to operate and navigate throughout our mix. Most all that same information we have right here in the new version of the inspector tab in Cubase 13. But in addition, we have another box up here that enables or disables that tab and has a brand new one. And this is the channel view. This is the channel tab. So we can get rid of this one altogether and just use the channel tab if we want. And like the inspector, it's completely resizable. So it can be as thick or as thin as you need it to be. And this basically duplicates a lot of the same information that's in our older existing inspector tab. And it just puts it in a much more streamlined place for you to get to most of the console view controls. So read and write, you can monitor things, solo enable, Record, enable, all your tabs up here are still in effect. So is the EQ, which enlarges and then gets out of the way once your cursor is off of it. So these are really welcome additions in this regard because if you don't always need all of the information in the inspector tab here and you don't need the tabbed windows and that kind of stuff, if you're really just working, especially on a single screen, so laptop users are going to rejoice about this, this allows you to really go through your entire mix quickly and see exactly what everything is doing that you would normally do in the mix console and have it immediately visible right here. And one of the really big changes is gonna be in the mix console window. So let's take a look in Cubase 12. Here's our familiar mix console window and this is resizable with the GNH keys. We can expand and contract as we need to. And this layout has become very familiar, especially with those of us that work with Cubase on a daily basis. And we're in front of the screen eight to 10 hours a day. 
how it affects your eyes and how the selection process works and all those things has a lot to do with the familiarity that you have in Cubase alone. So all of that's going to change for every user, obviously. In Cubase 13, as we open up its Mixed Console, you can see things have changed pretty dramatically here. So we have resizable windows for the Inspector tab, just like we did here in Cubase 12. So those are all the same. That hasn't changed dramatically. But the mixer itself, the actual Mixed Console window itself, has changed dramatically. And we can see this is going to be something that you either love or hate. There's lots of bright white text kind of fired at you at one time. So this might be difficult to work in in extended periods of time. And whether or not you like the new aesthetic where everything is sort of two-dimensional and flat, um, that is going to be totally a user-based thing. Another big new change to Cubase 13 is the way the range tool works. So for those people that do a lot of composition, especially using MIDI tracks and MIDI parts, these are going to be welcome additions because now the new range tool works in both the MIDI editor and the drum tool. And we have some huge new additions to the function of the range tool itself and what it can accomplish, especially when it relates to MIDI parts, because we now have the ability to work with multiple MIDI parts at the same time. In Cubase 13, we have a couple of different features here we didn't have before. The same box structure exists, but when we choose visibility and it opens up the MIDI editor window here, we can choose which one of the tracks are visible to work on. And this allows us to work on more than one part at a time. This is a really big change, very powerful, opens up lots of new MIDI editing possibilities and makes it much more flexible for your particular work zone here. So we can hide or enable whichever one of the tracks we want to work on. This makes it much faster to jump back and forth between different MIDI parts to edit and work on without having to jump back into the project view and then back into the editor window. And then of course the zones and track features are still there as well. One of the big new changes to Cubase 13 is the addition of all the new plugins and instruments. And one of those is tailored specifically for vocalists and it's called Vocal Chain. Vocal Chain is a plugin that sets up vocal chains specifically to process vocals. And this is great for young vocalists that are just starting out mixing and maybe don't know how to set up a vocal chain or how to set up an effective vocal chain. This puts everything in the right order, right at your fingertips, and it gives you some great presets to start with so that you can jump in and process high quality and sophisticated professional vocals without having to know a lot about how they actually should go together in the first place. And so we've got a rap vocal here, it sounds like this. Ends, fire up the blunt, switch a sweet sour diesel. Giving up the deuces to your homies and your people. Sipping on the flash, hit the gas full throttle. Rubbing on that leg of that top notch model. Beat banging out that knocking that system. Window tint it up, giving it up, how I'm living. On this track, we had a pre-existing vocal effects chain already. We're going to disable all of that and see how close we can get to it with the new vocal chain presets. Just a heads up, our pre-existing vocal chain with all of the effects in the order and everything produces about 38 milliseconds worth of latency. So we're going to go up into our plugin collection. We're going to navigate down to the vocal chain effect, and we're going to put one of these on our track. It shows up and it gives us this interface here, super clean and straight away, very easy to work with. Everything is kind of where you would want to put it anyway. And you'll see that they have all of these different effects here ready to go. And more importantly, maybe, is that they're in the right order. These effects are put in the order that you would more than likely build a vocal chain with. Tons of presets in here to play with, lots of stuff to get you started. And once you get it loaded up, you can tweak to your heart's content. So we'll start with this one called perfect pop dry vocal, and it uses quite a few of these effects. In fact, most of them, but the cost of all those plugins is fairly high latency. So if you're at the end of your project and you're trying to eke out every ounce of performance from your computer, you might want to keep that in mind. So let's enable vocal chain and see what we get for our lead vocal. Fire up the blunt, switch a sweet sour diesel. Giving up the deuces to your homies and your people. Sipping on the flash, hit the gas full throttle. Rubbing on that leg up the top. As you can hear, this has done a pretty good job of bringing the vocal up front. It's got a lot of nice texture, body, and heft to it. And we can go through each one of the modules and dial this into our taste. It's got a little bit of sibilance issues and things, but that's going to be pretty easy to fix as we have most of these modules in the correct order to begin with. So most of the problems we'll be chasing will automatically be fixed or severely reduced by using these in their order. 
In addition to the new vocal-oriented plugins that we have to play with, we also have some brand new analog-style passive EQ plugins to play with as well. And these are really nice emulations of a Pultec-style EQ. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Pultec-style EQs, they're passive analog EQs that are just about impossible to make sound bad, even in extreme settings. So these are really powerful, they sound great, but more importantly, they're wired into the interface of Cubase, which makes them nice and sleek easy to get to, low latency, but more importantly, we don't have to go to outside subscriptions to achieve the same things. The first emulation is the EQ M5. This is the mid-range version, and it's very similar to the other emulations by companies like Waves and Universal Audio. In this first example, we'll use it to pull some mid-range out of an existing rap vocal. When you're riding in that sun, in the drop top, with that wind blowing through you. Take some uh -huh. 400 out. With that fat blunt you rolling, smoking. So it's really tough to overdo these EQs because they're passive. The EQ P1A is the companion EQ of the two analog EQs offered. And again, this is so nice to have them wired into the interface where you don't have to go to outside subscriptions to use them. The P1A is great for adding a little bit of low end weight and thickness to a vocal or adding some creamy, smooth analog highs to the top end if you need a silky, smooth top end without having it be harsh or excessively sibilant. So a great choice here for both of these analog style EQs. We've also got some new plugins inside of Cubase 13 to play with, and one of them is called VoxComp. And this is a powerful plugin with a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. It's kind of in the same flavor as sort of Waves, Renaissance, or Vocal Compressors, but it's incredibly simple to operate and it has great results. So let's check out a little bit more about VoxComp. We've got a female vocal here into a mix that actually transitions from chest voice to falsetto and back again. And that's having difficulty staying consistent in the mix. This is a really beautiful vocal by Shana Marie Pascal. She's a phenomenal Northwest artist. And in this particular example, we're just going to use Vox Comp to help bring her out of the mix a bit. As you can see, just a super sparse interface here. We've got nothing but the meters on the top. We've got a wet dry knob that allows us to do a little bit of parallel processing. We've got a threshold knob and then the output knob for makeup gain. And that's really about it. There's a lot going on in the background of this, but it's really designed to be just super simple and get great results fast. Let's bring it in. Just wanna be your girl. So take my keys, my car, the driver's seat, and I won't say. What you can hear is as we drop the threshold and begin to engage the compressor, it brings the level up considerably. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the background here, because as you can see, there's no controls for attack or release, there's no knee controls, any of those things. So these kinds of really simple to operate effects are super effective, especially when you're just getting started in mixing and you're looking for simple solutions that do a lot of things technically in the background, but provide a solid polished vocal effect with as little knob fiddling as possible. VoxComp is a great choice for that. One of the other new powerful compressors inside of Cubase 13 is the brand new Black Valve. And this is a big fat analog style compressor, tube based compressor emulation that sounds great and gives us lots of familiar analog style controls, kind of an opto feel. So when you're looking for something with a lot of character and a lot of kind of analog mojo, the black valve is a great place to start. And we're gonna use it on a bass guitar here. We've got a basic track here that's a little dull and it's having a hard time kind of getting to the front of the mix. And in addition, it's played on flat wounds, which makes it even duller. So let's take a listen to this and we'll start it off in its default settings. So we'll add some peak reduction here and a little bit of makeup gain as well. We'll keep it at 100% wet. And then we're going to add the drive character to this and see if we can get a little grit to it. 
There we go. And you can hear we're starting to get a nice aggressive kind of grit to it. Helps it come to the front of the mix a little more. We're going to drive the input section just a little bit so we get a bit more gain reduction. Let's bypass it first and hear what we started with. And then let's engage it. I can definitely see this compressor getting a lot of views. It's a great analog vibe style compressor, kind of in the same vein as an all tube, very mute compressor. Great on vocals, great on bass, anywhere where you really need a lot of analog flavor and character and vibe, but it's super simple to operate. So Black Valve, I think is a really nice addition to the overall arsenal of tools that are already in Cubase. One of the other big changes from Cubase 12 to Cubase 13 is the chord pads update. So for those of you that used the chord pads feature in Cubase 12, it was always a great and powerful tool to come up with sketches and grooves and things like that quickly. In Cubase 13, it's gotten quite a bit of an update with lots of new features and functions, including the ability to work with more pads at the same time and grooves and patterns. So let's dive in. The chord pad was always a lot of fun to use and it gave us lots of creative control, a great starting point for ideas. We could edit those, we could change the way they were played. We could actually play with different Patterns, if we wanted to use something besides just clicking on it, we could have a pattern play. But it was pretty limited. We couldn't choose a lot of patterns. In fact, we could only choose one, or we could import a MIDI loop from a bunch of the stuff from the media bay. So that was helpful. We could trigger it from the MIDI keyboard. Lots of other stuff here to choose from. But if you're just putting pads together for ideas, this wasn't super helpful. It really required some theory knowledge to kind of get yourself started. So in 13, we've gotten a pretty big facelift for the chord pads in general. For one, we can have a few more chord pads to begin with. And in addition, we now have a super fast way to create new chord progressions by simply going to the preset box here and opening up all of these different styles of chord progressions that we have to choose from. So a super fast way to get ideas started without necessarily having to know how to create them. When you're just looking for some cool chill chords over a beat or something, this is a much faster way to obtain them. You can simply start with something that sounds cool and then go from there. If it's too high or too low, for example, for your voice and you don't like the key that it's in, but you like the chord progression you've selected already, might be cool and chill, but you want it in a different key. Now we can come up here and actually change the root key and it adjusts all of these simultaneously. This is great if you've got a really great progression, but you wanna change the key of the entire progression. In addition, we also have way more patterns to actually audition our chord selections with now. We simply click on the chord pattern drop-down box and we have all of these different patterns that can play. So if you're not a strong keyboard player, but you like the chord selections, It's gonna play through all those different types of patterns. The ability to change the orientation of the pads from a keyboard orientation, for example, to a grid orientation. So if you're working on a pad controller like an Akai, this is super helpful for that. So many other things to go into, like our step editor that's changed, and now we can actually add chords directly to our timeline just by clicking on the chord pads themselves. There's so much more to go into. We're gonna make a complete video on just the chord pad update. Cubase 13 has added some really impressive new VST instruments to play with. And one of those is called Iconica Sketch. Now, Cubase 12 always had some strong tool sets. And if you happen to own Hallian's Symphonic Orchestra, this was a powerful tool set with a lot of stuff to play with. There was a lot of choices in here that were incredibly well sampled. So that was great, except it wasn't included in Cubase 12. It was a separate VST purchase as an instrument. A 
However, now in 13, we have Iconica Sketch. This is an amazing, complete orchestral tool set at your disposal. It sounds phenomenal with amazing samples and it comes completely free. It's included in Cubase Pro, Artist and Elements and might just be worth the upgrade price alone. The sampler track in Cubase 13 got some pretty big updates as well, especially in the area of auto warp. We've got some new modes to play with, and we also have a ton of new LFO and envelope shapes to play with. Cubase 12 sample editor was a great starting point and lots of flexibility, but we were limited by some of the algorithms. So for example, if we wanted to take a vocal and slow it down, the fidelity really started to suffer. This one right here is for the West Coast. This one right here is for the West this one right here is for the West Coast. You could really hear the quality starts to suffer. It gets grainy and sounds pretty nasty. And we only really had two choices, music and solo. If we come over here to Cubase 13 and the new sample editor, we've got some new options. And now when we come down to playback, our audio warp settings give us quite a few more choices to play with. We can change the key, speed the formats like we could before, but we have a couple of spectral modes we didn't have before. This one right here is for the West Coast. If we just slow this down now, the same thing. This one right here is for the West Coast. This actually makes a much cleaner version of that transition. If we go back to the normal solo that we had before. This one right here is for the West Coast. You can hear that graininess and kind of artificiality. But now with the new spectral choices here, both for music and for just vocal, let's choose the vocal again. This one right here is for the West Coast. So a much, much better algorithm overall. Some new toys to play with in the sampler. Over here in the filter section, we've got some new options to play with. There are just a ton of new LFO envelopes and shapes to either draw or paint in. This just gives us a ton of new ways to mangle sound. We'll get into more of the sample editor in future videos because there's just way too much here to go into in such a short video. One of the biggest changes to Cubase 13 is finally the ability to change the stereo or mono configuration of a track with one click. This is such a big deal when you get down towards the end of a project and you realize, man, I really should have made that a stereo track because now I want to put a ping pong delay on it or something. This adds a ton of workflow features to it that weren't available in the previous versions of Cubase. And it's just a real time saver and something that I think everybody is probably going to use a lot of. One of the super fun changes they made with Cubase 13 is they brought back the vocoder. Now, this was actually in previous versions of Cubase back in the day, but as things got better quality and higher fidelity, they took it out and they brought it back with a ton of new features and functions. And it's not just good for EDM and dance tracks. It's also great for things like beefing up existing vocals and a lot of other tricks and stuff. So let's dive in and find out a bit more about the brand new vocoder feature in Cubase 13. We're just going to use this to thicken up a hook. Uh, in a rap song, we've got basic hooks going on. It sounds like this. So live it up till you take your last breath. Hey. All right, so we're going to use this and we're going to grab just that hook section there and use it just to strengthen that up with a low vocoder note on it. And we're going to use it just to beef up the bottom end of it. And we can also change the root note of it as well. We could take it down to C. Now that's low, but if we bring it up to the third octave, so there's a quick side-by-side -side comparison of Cubase 12 versus Cubase 13. And hopefully this has given you enough information to be able to determine whether the update is worth it to you or not. I would really be interested to find out what your opinion of the new graphical changes have been to the console view and the project view. 
I think these are going to affect the most amount of people, and it really just depends on your own personal workflow as to whether or not it works for you. So, hey, if you learned something more, if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. It does help keep the channel going. Stay safe. Be creative. Add something creative to the world. It could really use it. We'll catch you guys in the next video.